The city ship was right where they'd said it would be, all swoopy lines and strange architecture that told me it certainly hadn't been designed on my home planet, but more concerning were the blast marks and the floating space junk. Hang back while we do a couple more scans, said Captain Sunlight with a stern look on her lizardy face. Since she was in the co-pilot's seat today, she hit the buttons and levers and whatever for those scans herself, while Weo the pilot dutifully brought us to a stop. The cockpit lights made the blue stripes on Weo's tentacles shine extra bright, which always reminded me of a blue-ringed octopus. Weo probably wasn't venomous. Probably. Someone would have told me if she was, right? At any rate, it wasn't polite to ask. I was still pretty new on this courier ship, though finding my feet with respectable speed, and I'd felt confident enough to ask if I could watch our approach from the cockpit. Captain Sunlight had even said yes. I count over two dozen military ships, she told Weo. They look to be allied with the city in guard formation. No active kerfuffle, then? Weo asked, tapping the console idly with one tentacle while wrapping and unwrapping several others around the chair's central post. She was never still. I wondered if aliens ever had ADHD. Again, not going to ask. I think not, but there was clearly recent trouble and they're braced for more. Captain Sunlight looked at the clock, probably thinking about the shipment we were due to deliver and whether any delays would mean trouble for us. Well, we're hardly any safer out here, she decided. Plenty of asteroids in quick flight distance. Who knows what raiders could be hiding with scan blockers. Let's do business quickly, then be gone. In we go, Weo said with a tentacle flip in place of a nod. She angled the solar sails and manipulated a bunch of other controls I didn't recognize, and in moments we were zipping toward the city ship, specifically toward one outstretched curve shaped like a shark fin. A docking bay opened as we approached, right next to a blast mark that was worryingly deep. I spoke up. Should we wear exosuits during the unloading, just in case? I grasped the edge of the barstool-sized passenger seat, feeling like a kid on a car trip with opinions about which detour to take. But Captain Sunlight was nodding. Couldn't hurt, she said, pressing another button with a yellow-scaled hand. I'm sure no one will blame us for not trusting the life support systems of this wing right now. Speaking of which, Weo said as we approached the door, looks awfully dark in there. It does. Captain Sunlight flicked on the high beams. Let's help them out with that. The lights showed us a wide enough empty space to land in, among other ships and various storage crates in what looked to me like suspicious disarray. Weo folded the sails early to get them out of the way and set us down by the door which closed behind us. A pair of water wheels approached calmly enough, with no weapons to be seen anywhere about their gooey bodies. If you picture a circular fridge made of jello, which has been stirred with musty pond water and half a fridge's worth of solid objects, then you've got a water wheel. I've rarely seen more than a couple of them in one place, and I had no idea how they worked, but they were generally polite in my experience. I had one question about this pair. Can all water wheels jump like that? I asked. The water wheels bounded across the dock like the goofiest of slow motion cartoons. Then their speed registered. Oh, the gravity here is low, isn't it? Yes, and it's not supposed to be, Sunlight said with a frown. I hope it's just this wing. That could cripple a city. She hit the inship intercom. Exo suits for everybody, and be prepared for low gravity. This is a whole crew job as quickly and safely as possible. Go. With that, she unbuckled and hopped down from the chair, pointing at Weo. You stay and monitor everything we got sensors for. You go get dressed, she said to me. On it, I said, standing up from my own chair and hurrying for the door. I was much taller than she was, and it wouldn't do to loom over the captain. Plus, we had urgent work to do. The rest of the crew were either already at the cargo bay or on the way there. I stepped over and around the various tails, tentacles, and bug legs of my crewmates to grab the only human-sized exosuit and put it on in the hallway. Not so crowded there. I could hear the faint sound of Weo's voice over the external speakers, telling the water wheels that we would open the door in just a moment. Patience, please. It really was just a moment. This crew had gotten fast at putting their suits on. I should probably practice. I'd just gotten it zipped and sealed when Captain Sunlight did the airlock check. Ready, I called, adding my voice to the rest. It was over-preparedness, since nobody was in the airlock yet. 
and I was back in the hall anyway, but being overprepared sounded like a great idea today. The airlock worked fine. The loading dock had air anyway. The local gravity was low but usable. Everything was okay. I told myself that as I joined the rest of the delivery crew in wrangling boxes through two different levels of gravity. Whoop, that's awkward, I muttered at my first step off the ship. Good thing I'd picked a small box to carry, since the step that carried me over the threshold drifted much farther than I'd expected, and I almost tripped. Got it under control, though. A water wheel pointed with what passed for an arm, and I did my hop-skipping best to follow the directions for where to put the box. We were making a stack against a wall, quickly, efficiently, hoppingly, and with the crates all lined up with tidy lines. Good for us. Your ship lights are helpful, said the nearest water wheel in a bubbly voice. Our backup lights only show you how much you can't see, and the main ones have been out dead since the impact. Not like the gravity. That's been... I found for myself how that had been when the gravity suddenly doubled. Good thing I'd already set down my box. I collapsed to my knees, caught off guard, gasping for breath in the exosuit. Thuds and exclamations of pain filled the dock. I stayed on all fours, taking deep breaths and staring at the condensed blob of goo that was an irritated-sounding water wheel. Then the gravity released, and everything drifted gently upward. The water wheel stretched out to normal height, like one of those toys with a spring inside. Somebody was swearing loudly. Sounded like G's glorious exoskeleton didn't do much for his joints in extreme gravity. Poor guy. I drifted to the floor again and realized that the gravity was back on a low setting. We could still upload without swimming through the air. I didn't relish the idea of trying to wrangle this many boxes in zero G. But we might have to, I reminded myself, as I straightened out sore knees and bounded toward the ship. Here's hoping the gravity holds steady. It mostly did. There was a brief stint of normal Earth levels, which was enough to make the Frillian twins stumble where they were team-carrying a heavy crate. I was close by and jumped forward to lend a hand. Together we set it in place, and they both thanked me for the help. I didn't admit that it was more of an instinct to avoid being crushed. I was totally a helpful mini-hero. Yay for me. But then we were actually done unloading, and Captain Sunlight had signed everything over to the water wheels, and next came the hard part. Picking up our next delivery. It was three large crates, made of purple wood, and each one taller than I was. Murr. How many hover sleds do we have right now? Captain Sunlight asked. Only one big enough for those, Murr said. He draped a blue-black tentacle over his pointy squid head, making his clear exosuit squeak. A couple of the small ones will probably work in pairs, though. Captain Sunlight grimaced inside her helmet. Many displeased sharp teeth. Let's do it. Everyone be very careful. We were. Nobody got any toes or other body parts anywhere near crushing range, and Murr steered the sled into our ship during another patch of standard gravity. That crate was fine. The next one was a disaster and a half. It was damaged to start with, a smashed corner that had happened before we arrived. Captain Sunlight made sure to note in the documentation that it hadn't been our fault, and she got the water wheels to confirm it. They were reasonably sure that the stuff inside wasn't damaged and that the actual owners wouldn't be upset. These folks were just dock-working intermediaries, not the owners themselves. With that vote of confidence, we got the movement underway, only to be slammed with enough gravity to completely lose the crate off the sleds. It hit the floor with a boom. The sleds shot off in opposite directions. Everyone fell down. Something smashed against the far wall. Just a trash can, said a water wheel, puddled on the floor. The other one burbled in frustration. The gravity went light again after that, which was the perfect chance for trash to float through the room, along with a variety of things from the broken corner of the crate. It was such a mess. The trash was mostly dry, thankfully, though something had spilled inside the crate to make most of what was drifting out damp and green. One of the water wheels muttered something about it smelling like kombucha. So now we had a bunch of kombucha-scented cloth? Silks. Oh, man, I thought, that looks expensive. That looks... And there were other things, too, which could have been paperweights or precious gems or who knew what else. I sure didn't. Blip-blop, you two shoved the broken crate to the side, Captain Sunlight directed the Frillians. 
Let's get this other one loaded, then assess. Everyone stay close to the floor. That seemed like good advice. I grabbed some of the wet silks floating past and made my way over to stuff them back into their crate, hopping with both feet together and my knees bent, as ready as I could be for the malfunctioning gravity to jerk us around again. It stayed light for a longer span than I expected, but no one was complaining. Well, not about that, anyway. The silks got stuck on every sharp corner in the room, of which there were many. One clump even lodged above an emergency light. No one was eager to go up that high and grab it. I looked at G, who was limping past with a pile of mossy-looking cloth that he was trying to keep from snagging on his praying mantis pincher arms. Think we should leave that one for somebody to get later, when the gravity works and they have a ladder. Yes, he said before I'd finished talking. Not worth the risk. An urgent beep nearby turned out to be a communicator that had been hidden somewhere among a water wheel's floating bits, gross and not worth thinking about too long, and which proved to be a phone call from the owners of the crates. They were returning to their wing of the city ship now that the danger was over, and they wanted to check on their belongings. Uh, yes. See you soon, the water wheel said, looking at the phone in a way that said the call had already been ended. Or plasma. Hey, old folks. The ambassadors are on the way. Be on your best behavior because they are cranky and important. But you didn't hear that from me. Duty noted, Captain Sunlight called back. She urged the crew to finish getting the unbroken crate on board. Gravity was still light, but it could change at any time. The water wheel with the phone spun in place, a worried pirouette. One little arm extension pointed at the silk caught on the light. Do you have any long-reach grabbing tools? The water wheel asked Z. Don't think so, G said. That bit might have to wait. But the water wheel was rapidly becoming an anxious mess, concerned that the ambassadors would pitch a fit about their belongings strewn about the loading dock. It sounded like these were people who could cause trouble for lowly workers who displeased them. What kind of ambassador acts like that, I wondered. Aren't they supposed to be tactful all the time? Maybe they're just rude to the help. I've certainly met that sort of people before. My thoughts about entitled jerks from home were interrupted by the water wheel actively trying to recruit someone to climb up the wall and grab the cloth. G refused. Paint said her arms were too short anyway, and everybody else was busy. I sighed deeply and took stock of the small handholds in the architecture. I'll do it, I said. G called out, try not to break yourself on the job, but was otherwise no help. Paint was worried. The gravity could change again, she objected rubbing the fingers of her suit together in a way that normally made her orange scales click. Stress gesture. I'll be fast, I said. Can you move one of the spare hover sleds under me, just in case? She did, rushing off to grab one while I bounced over carefully and started testing handholds. If the gravity increased to normal while I was climbing, I should be okay, but extreme crush might be a problem. I didn't want to get my fingers stuck. That was a quick route to a potential amputation even with the exosuit. I'm just going to jump up there, I announced when Paint brought the sled over. She looked even more worried, but the water wheel urged me on. The ambassadors would be here soon. Deep breath time. The cloth was stuck at about twice my height, a green and gold filmy bundle drifting lazily on the air currents. Pipes and seams and such like made a path below it. I could have moved boxes over here to build a staircase with, but high gravity might put my foot right through one, and anyway there wasn't time. I got a running start and tried to sprint toward the wall, though the best I could do was a series of hops with increasing speed. I jumped off the hover sled in a way that was probably against several rules, got a toehold that was just barely big enough, and leapt upward. I almost missed and drifted back out into open air, my heart rate did not like that but I managed to grab the silk, yanked it free, clutched the light with my free hand to pull myself closer to the wall, then rebounded off a pipe on my way forward. I touched down on the hover sled, just as the gravity increased again. At least the sled bounced a bit when I collapsed onto it, spinning away from where paint and the water wheel were laid out on the floor, their hoorays turned into ouches. This stint of heavy gravity was brief. I rode the sliding hover sled over to the broken crate, waving the silk like a banner. My suit was probably going to stink of kombucha, but that was a small price to pay for victory. Got it, I declared. Nice, 
Mur said, grabbing the silk and hurrying to stuff it back into the hole while everyone else was getting to their feet or the equivalent. Like the water wills, Mur didn't fall down so much as squish. That's the last of war. He jumped back as something small and grey scrambled out of the hole and made a mad dash for the boxes. That's a rat, I said, somewhat stupidly. But maybe it wasn't as much of a Captain Obvious moment as I'd thought. No one else recognized the animal. A what? Mur demanded. Is it dangerous? Captain Sunlight asked quickly, while the rest of the crew shouted about it. Not really, I said, watching in surprise as the furry little beastie found a hiding spot between boxes. I mean, some do carry diseases, but their teeth are small. Well, not sharp, anyway. Nobody liked that answer. Not the captain. Worried about danger to the crew. Not the water wills. Worried about what the ambassadors would say. Not paint. Hyperventilating in a corner. Blip patted her on the shoulder. It's not that big of a deal, I insisted. Oh, we're in exosuits. Let me see if I can catch it before the ambassadors get here. Where's that trash can? Way over by the far wall. I pushed the hover sled like a surfboard for more speed and zoomed over to grab it in a way that wouldn't put me in danger of a high-grav faceplant. Wish I'd thought of this sooner. I dumped out the last of the soda cans and whatever, grabbed the lid off the floor, then zipped back the way I had come with the dented trash can in tow. Now, catching a rat is normally a time-intensive process that involves traps, patience and bait. We had none of that, but we did have excellent luck and a patch of normal gravity. The trash can was squarish, which meant no open spots when laid on the ground with some hastily retrieved silks crumpled inside to hide among. At my directions, everyone shoved boxes into rows, making a corridor that led to the trash can. Then I flushed the rat out of hiding. Ooh, it was a quick one. Scuttled right by me in the wrong direction, only to be menaced by Z into changing course for the corridor. The rest of the crew, most of them, were lined up behind the boxes to funnel the rat toward the trash can. Those with soft exosuits that could be bitten through, like Myrrh, hung back with the water wills. And paint, because she was apparently afraid of rats for some reason. Not judging. The rat dove into the silks, just as I'd hoped, but when Block moved to slam the lid on, it zipped right back out. Many hands reached for it, but the rat was wily and panicked. It dodged everyone and leapt off the captain's shoulder. Then the gravity went gloriously light, and that befuddled rat sailed, squeaking, right into my waiting hands. I got it in a no-bitey grip with my thumb under one foreleg and my finger under its chin, cradled the butt with my other hand, and moved it safely into the trash can before the gravity did anything else stupid. Closed the lid, snapped it into place, then sat on it for good measure. To wild approval. It was while everyone was cheering and singing my praises that the ambassadors walked in without exosuits, hopped really looking just as cranky as expected. They were human though, and that was a surprise, a disappointing one. What is happening in here? What kind of professionalism is this? demanded the grey-haired pale guy. Who is in charge? asked the matching woman in tones of deep disapproval. The water wills greeted them with humble apologies, followed by Captain Sunlight with level-headed patience. Neither made much of a dent in their attitude. It's damaged. And who do we have to blame for that? Clearly someone wasn't handling it well. Don't try to blame this on low gravity. That just sounds like an excuse for incompetence to me. Nobody had mentioned the rat yet. I picked up the trash can and strolled over. What's this? asked the woman. I set it down. The rat inside scrabbled madly at the sides. You will be pleased to know, I announced, that at great risk to life and limb, we have recaptured your pet. Pet? the woman asked. What pet? the man said sharply. Your rat, I said with false innocence. Little grey cutie. I was cut off by a flood of objections. If it's not yours, then why was it in your crate? We all saw it jump out and assumed you would want it back. No, we don't want it back, the man yelled, getting a bit red in the face. Oh, that's a pity, I said. You're telling me a rat got in there too, the woman asked, after someone here broke it open. Oh, no, not at all, I said. Then I wiped the smile from my face. I'm telling you that your shipment contained a potentially deadly animal, and if not for the damage sustained by gravity fluctuations due to the city ship's recent impacts, 
we would have been obliged to bring that risk on board our own ship, where we do not wear exosuits in our day-to-day -day lives. They had a lot to say, but I went on. I'm sure you're upset about the damage done to your shipment, and I agree. That is unfortunate. The rat has probably made quite a nest inside the box. I recommend a biohazard team handle it from this point forward. But any concern for material losses must come second to the very real risk you have introduced to this loading dock, and possibly the city. Where was the crate packed? The woman answered my question with a name I'd never heard of while the man objected. What are you talking about, deadly risk? He sputtered. It's a rat. I adopted a concerned expression. You are familiar with hantavirus, are you not? Salmonellosis, rat bite fever? Rodents carry many diseases, and if this isn't a pet, then it's anyone's guess what contagions its bite contains. The ambassadors could have been reasonable people and owned up to the problem, or at least blamed it on whoever had packed the crate. But no, they were jerks who tried to blame it on us. They stormed out into the hallway, shouting for some sort of officials who had escorted them there, and immediately began trying to spin the situation. Luckily for us, the officials, human too, had already had enough of this pair and easily believed our account of things, especially once I fished out a chunk of wood with bite marks from the broken crate. I'd glimpsed it earlier when putting away the silks, but I hadn't thought about what kind of marks those were until now. Sure looked like the rat had been trying to get out before the crate broke. Well, how about you pay these nice people? The lead official suggested with the faintest smile on her face. There's been no harm done, and they'll want to be on their way delivering your other two crates. Unless we should check those for pests, too. The ambassadors said of course the other two crates were fine, and since the cameras in our cargo bay had been repaired, Captain Sunlight was willing to allow them on board under supervision. Assuming the ambassadors signed for potential further damages, on the off chance that another problem animal did show its head during the short trip. This was even less pleasant for the ambassadors to swallow, but under the polite insistence of the officials, they finally agreed. Grumpily. Then once the form was signed, they flounced off with as much dignity as the low gravity allowed. Captain Sunlight put a small hand on my arm. How much of a biohazard should we clean for? She asked quietly. I can have Weo get the sanitizing hose for all the exosuits before we board, though it will be messy. It's probably not that bad, I murmured back. Just tell her to bring the medical scanner to check the rat. Got it. Weo was out in a flash, and the gravity behaved while the trash can lid was cracked open for the scan. What do you know? The rat was perfectly healthy. Not even any fleas. The official woman smiled. Well, that's good news. I wonder if it's an escaped pet after all. You're welcome to adopt it, I said, pushing the can forward a smidge. Though I will give you all the warnings about handling it without gloves. You don't want to get bitten, even by a healthy rat. We'll see if anyone has reported a lost one, she said. Then who knows? I might just have somebody in mind who's always wanted a pet that's a challenge. She exchanged looks with the two quiet officials beside her. All yours, I said with a dramatic wave toward the trash can. I looked at the water wheels. Should they bring the can back afterward, or will you be getting a new one that's not dented? New one? burbled the closer water wheel. You can go ahead and recycle that. Well, said Captain Sunlight with a clap of her gloved hands, this has all been exciting, but we do have a schedule to at least attempt to keep. Yes, I'm sure, said the official. Thank you for handling this mess and catching the rat. All credit goes to Robin here. Captain Sunlight said with a gesture toward me. Our resident animal expert and quick thinker. I tried to compose a proper Orshuk's reply, but the official just shook my hand with more thanks. Robin, is it? Well, we are grateful. What's your surname? Bennett, I told her, and she nodded with the kind of look that said she was committing it to memory. That was more of a compliment than the words, really. It's a fine thing to have people in authority think well of you. There was another round of general thank-you goodbyes, then we all trooped back on board. The city ship's gravity was still light, which made the heaviness inside our ship feel foreign. But by the time I got my exosuit off, it was all just about normal. I gave the gloves a wipe-down with some cleaner while the engines rumbled to life. It really did smell like kombucha. When I left the cargo bay, I met Weo coming to find me. After a moment of who's flying the ship, 
Kavlai was taking a turn, Wio said she had questions. Just how common are those diseases you mentioned? she asked. Was it actually a big risk? Well, not with the suits, I said. And they're less common than they used to be, but still something to keep in mind with wild rats. Do the wild ones look the same as the domesticated kind? You really can't tell at a glance if it was a pet. Tame ones are usually a little more delicate, but they're the same species, I told her. We never really bred rats for anything specific, not like we did with dogs. So you just decided that the disease-ridden, bitey little things chewing on your belongings would make perfect pets as is. Yup, basically, I said, except for the disease. Most of our pets could be described as bitey little troublemakers, but that's part of their charm. She patted my leg with a blue-striped tentacle that probably wasn't poisonous. Likewise, I'm sure. Hey, now, I haven't bitten anyone since I was a kid, I said. Oh, asteroids, I was joking. Sure you were.